uh, science today. Yeah. Even looking into how cells work, all that good stuff. Right. And we're about to kind of shake things up a little bit. Okay. We're going to be looking at Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life by Gerald Pollack. Okay. And we're talking about challenging some very basic assumptions like textbook biology kind of stuff here. Absolutely, yeah. Pollock, he uh, he doesn't shy away from a little controversy, you know. Okay. He really questions some of those fundamental assumptions about how cells do their thing. Okay. Particularly when it comes to ion transport. Okay. How those tiny charged particles move in and out of cells. So we're talking about stuff that, like, people just take for granted. What's the big deal about, like, how a few little ions move around? Well, it turns out ion transport, it's, like, essential for almost everything cells do. Really? Oh, yeah. Think about your nerves sending signals. Okay. Your muscles contracting, even your heart beating. Wow. All those processes, they depend on ions moving across those cell membranes. Okay, I'm starting to see why we're digging into this. So what exactly is Pollock, like, what's his main challenge to this whole ion transport idea? Well, he argues that our traditional understanding, particularly that focus on ion pumps and channels, right? it might be kind of obscuring a simpler, more elegant mechanism that's actually happening. Okay. Pollock, he compares this to that old geocentric view of the universe. Oh, oh, yeah. Where astronomers came up with these really complicated explanations for like how the planets moved. Right. All because they were stuck on this idea that the Earth was the center of everything. Right, right. Like those epicycles, all those like loopy orbits they made up to yeah. make the math work. Exactly. And Pollock's suggesting maybe we're doing something similar in cell biology, adding all these layers of complexity when a simpler explanation might be right there in front of us. So Pollock thinks we're like way overcomplicating things. What does he say is going on instead of those textbook explanations with the pumps and the channels and all that? Well, he really starts by taking a hard look at those very structures, those ion channels, the mm. proteins embedded in the cell membrane. Right. And they're often shown as these very selective gateways mm -hmm. that only allow certain ions to pass through. It's like little bouncers at the yeah. cell membrane, right? Deciding yeah. who gets in and who doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. But Pollock points out some pretty like significant challenges to this whole traditional view. Okay. One of the biggest ones comes from a technique called patch clamping. Oh, yeah. Which was used to study these ion channels. I remember reading about that. That's how scientists were able to like measure those tiny currents yeah. from like single ion channels opening and closing. Yeah. It was yeah. a pretty big deal. Didn't it even win a Nobel Prize? Yeah, back in 1991. Oh. But here's where it gets kind of interesting. Okay. Researchers, they later discovered that you could actually get very similar current fluctuations. Go ahead. Those supposed single channel recordings. Right. Even when they were using non-biological materials, right. like silicon rubber. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> silicon rubber, like what you use to caulk bathtubs. You're telling me that like inanimate materials can, what, mimic the behavior of these ion channels? It seems that way. Yeah, that's what the research suggests. Right. And it's not just silicon rubber. They found similar results with polymer filters as well. Hmm. So this whole thing, Pollock actually refers to this as the silicon rubber anomaly. Okay. And it really raises some serious questions about, like, were those patch clamp recordings really capturing what we thought they were? Right. That's super interesting. So mm -hmm. if these recordings aren't necessarily telling us what we thought, what does that mean for our understanding of these ion channels? Well, it really throws a wrench in that traditional view of these channels as highly specific gateways. Because if non-biological materials can produce similar electrical signals... It suggests that, you know, maybe something else is going on, something that doesn't require these precisely structured proteins. Okay. Pollock, he even quotes another scientist who just describes the selectivity of ion channels as weird, okay. <laughs> given some of these discrepancies. Okay, so maybe the ion channels aren't the whole story, but what about those energy-hungry pumps? Right. The ones that are, you know, they work tirelessly, pumping ions against their concentration gradients to, like, yeah. keep everything hunky-dory inside the cell. Uh, Surely those things got to be essential, right? Well, Pollock actually challenges that, too. Does he really? He says that the energy demands of these pumps, if they were solely responsible for maintaining these ion gradients, yeah. would be astronomical. Astronomical. Is he saying that our cells are, like, secretly violating the laws of thermodynamics? Not quite. Okay. But he does point to some really interesting research that kind of questions the traditional energy accounting Wait. when it comes to ion transport. Okay. He cites experiments where they subjected cells to 
like really extreme conditions, no oxygen, metabolic poisons. Oh, wow. Basically anything that would just cripple their energy production. So they basically like starved the cells and waited to see if they would collapse. Yeah, pretty much. Kind of brutal, but I guess that's science sometimes. Right. So what happened? Well, you might think that with, you know, no energy production, yeah. those ion gradients would just fall apart. Right, right. The cells would basically just die. Right, like a city with a power outage. Exactly. Everything shuts down. But that's not what happened. Really? The cells were surprisingly resilient. They held on to their ion gradients even when, theoretically, they should have been totally out of gas. So what's going on here? It's like Pollock is saying that these cells are performing some kind of biological magic trick. Mm -hmm. Where are they getting the energy to keep those gradients going, if not from the pumps? This is where I start to question everything I thought I knew. It's like you were saying, maybe the cells aren't breaking the laws of physics or anything, but maybe bending them in a way we just don't quite get yet. Right. So... If it's not these ion pumps working overtime, then what's the real story here? How are these cells maintaining order without, like, running out of gas? Well, that is the million-dollar question. Right. And Pollock, he offers up a pretty fascinating alternative perspective here. Remember how we've been talking about cells kind of like their little water balloons? Yep. With stuff inside? Right. Pollock says that's way too simple. Okay. He says, think more like a the interior of a cell is more like a... Like a complex gel. Okay, a gel. Yeah. Like, like jello or something. Mm. Or, or like those little silica packets that come with electronics. Those things are weird. Not exactly those kinds of gels, no. Okay. But, but you know, the analogy kind of helps, uh, to get at what Paul is talking about. Okay. He's basically saying that the water inside cells isn't just floating around randomly. It's structured, it's organized okay. by proteins, molecules, all forming this intricate matrix. So more like jello than a water balloon then. Yeah, there you go. Okay, all right. I, I can picture that a little better. But how does that gel like structure actually help with moving those ions around that? Well, Pollock's hypothesis is that this gel structure, which he actually calls the exclusion zone, okay. or EZ for short. Catchy. It can actually create and maintain those ion concentration gradients we've been talking about. Right. All without just relying on pumps going constantly. So the cell structure itself is doing some of that work? That's kind of wild when you think about it. It really is. It challenges us to think about cells totally differently. Yeah. Imagine, like, a busy city with all these roads and tunnels. Okay. The pumps, in this case, would be like trucks constantly moving people around. Right. And those trucks need a ton of fuel to keep going, to keep the city running. Exactly. Now, what if the city itself was designed so that people naturally flowed to where they needed to be using those roads and tunnels more efficiently? Okay. That makes sense. That's kind of what Pollock's getting at with this gel-like structure. Right. It creates an environment where things can just work more efficiently. So maybe those pumps are still there, but they're more like a backup generator. Right. Exactly. Okay. Rather than the main power source. Wow. And this brings us back to those starved cells. Right, right. If Pollock is right, those cells weren't doing anything magical. Yeah. They were just using the inherent properties of their own structure. Wow. To keep those ion gradients going, even when they were, you know, under stress. That's incredible. You know, when we started this whole thing, I thought we were just going to be talking about some tiny particles moving around. Right. <laughs> I had no idea we'd end up questioning, like, how we even think about cells. And what started is this... Simple question about ions.